Well, hello there, and welcome to another episode of Literary as Feck with uh, myself, uh, Nicolas O'Sheacon, and himself, uh, Clive Davis. Hello. Um, so uh, it's my choice uh, this week, and um, are you whispering? or whatever it is uh, to to make it more kind of um, what's that? You know, uh, PBS or whatever. You know, public broadcasting or, or NPR. Um, oh, I was I've mostly. Of, uh... Whistling Bob Harris and the old yes yeah yeah that 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 too I mostly because my wife is asleep at this point and um, already frowned at me earlier when I was being too she she accuses me of shouting at you all the way to Japan well how uh, else could I hear you it's a long way Nick um but uh, but yeah anyway so um, I saw someone playing um, uh, someone plays um, Whistling Bob Harris in the uh, recent Pistol miniseries. Uh, getting beaten up by Sid Vicious. Oh, sorry. He oh, attempts yes. to stab him, but stabs mm -hmm. someone else by accident in the throat with a bottle, which I did. It's funny, I was watching that. Have you seen the Pistol series? Not yet, no. Um, some of it was, um, some of it's really good, and some of it is slightly, like, uh, I felt as if they put some polemics in people's mouths that they wouldn't have spoken like that at the time. Right. Thing. Um, and I get, I mean, you know, Danny Boyle does have a very maximalist approach sometimes. And I, 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 in fi I very much like Danny Boyle's films mm -hmm. in general. But I had slightly, it would be interesting to see what you make of it. Because Yeah, yeah, I'll definitely get to it. Because but anyway, I that's got long... fuck all to do with... That has uh, nothing to do with oh. what we're talking about today. But what I did want to, to do was, I, I feel like we've done a good job um, of, of really talking about a lot of white male writers um and i thought we wouldn't want to mix it up too much by going um outside of the male zone but maybe we would move heaven forbid for for once we might try um but in, in fairness we have actually talked about a couple of japanese um authors yes. uh should but I, generally should speaking, I put on my pith helmet or so i i figured you know maybe and it, it's funny that we've written we've now done two books about africa both written by white europeans <laughs> Um, so eventually, maybe we'll read a book about Africa written by somebody who is African. Um, Steady on there, Nick. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but anyway, I, I, so this is a, a book by um, Sherman Alexi Jr. Uh, called The... Um, you don't want to get us kicked out of the gentleman's club. That is true. That's true. I, I, I have waxed my moustache, especially for tonight's soiree. Um, but yes, uh, the you're already food... lucky to be in as an Irishman. Oh, me too, as a Welshman, you know. So that's true. Yeah, yeah. We had to um, we had to be very obsequious, <laughs> prove that we weren't the kind of raging alcoholic um, Celts. But anyway, so yes, the book is, I believe, the absolutely true diary of a part-time Indian, mm -hmm. um, which is basically a kids' book. Um, and I don't know if I told you that yeah. before. Right. No, I, you didn't. Why? Okay. I suppose is the phrase you're looking for, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, it, it is a young adult book, so it's not a book. And you know, Sherman Alexi has written a number of books that are adult books, and you know, he's also known as a, a poet, um, and a screenwriter, and, and more a recently, harasser. And more recently, sadly, yes, as um, as a person who's kind of leveraged his position as an author and a important person in the indigenous communities. Yeah, to kind of maximize his ability to to have affairs and stuff. So I don't I don't know how that's all worked out for him and his family because he is married with kids. But anyway, a bit disappointing uh, to say the least. Um, but this book, I think I I don't know I'm trying to remember. So I you know that I worked for a couple of years on a uh, reserve um, in Canada. In, so in the US they're called reservations. Um, in Canada, they're called reserves. They're basically the same thing. They're where Indigenous people over time have had their land kind of um, shrunk down to these kind of postage stamp sized parcels all over North America. Um, and in the book, in this book, basically, at one point, uh, our, you know, our, our main character seems to be just an analog for Sherman Alexi. He's even called Junior. Um, mm he kind of rails about the fact that he feels like a, a lot of indigenous people have forgotten that these things were created really as kind of prisons in a way. Mm. Um, but what's interesting, so I, there's another really good book actually, um, which is more of a history called An Inconvenient Indian by uh, Thomas King. Um, Thomas King is uh, an indigenous, I think he's from the States originally, but he, he's a, a professor 
in Canada now, um, in Guelph. And uh, he's written a number of books, uh, kind of various books of, of fiction and stuff um, where he'll often weave kind of um, indigenous uh, myths and stuff into kind of um, more contemporary stuff. And they're often quite funny. But this book is as a curious account of native people in North America. It's really good. Mm. Um, and what's interesting is he... That looks take... like, um, um, and we'll get into this, but that looks like probably what I would have preferred you to have chosen. Oh, this okay, episode, but, Yeah. Okay, well, no, 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 that's fine. I mean, um, not everything can be, um, it would be boring if everything was shiny and great. And sometimes we have to have uh, things we're not as keen on or conflicts or. Sure. Anyway, I'm not, not to jump ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm not actually down on this book, but we'll get into mm. the minutiae of yeah. what, not my problem, but what I got out yeah. of it. Let's put it away from it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but what's interesting, so in, in that book, um, he basically talks about, well, this is the only land that indigenous people have that's like, that's theirs at this point. And in fact, if anything, they should be trying to expand the reserves. And so there are very few that have been able to do that where, where indigenous communities have been um, able to make enough money to buy neighboring parcels of land and actually make their, make their reserves bigger. Mm. Um, but anyway, I taught, so I taught on a reserve for three years, um, which had a, bunch of interesting things going on with it uh the all of the water basically from the lake was being um taken in an aqueduct and pumped to a nearby big canadian city mm. where it was being processed and drunk by everybody from all of the if you went to stay in a hotel there you got clean drinking water but the water in the lake wasn't clean because the way the aqueduct was built was pumping crap back into the lake and we had to well i mean i say we for three years i had to drink bottled water and even the water out of the shower was so heavily chlorinated, like it would kind of scald you. Um, are you deliberately, I, I'm just curious, are you deliberately mm -hmm. avoiding place names? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so, just, just so yeah. I know, because I was about well, to say, ah, yeah, wasn't that? <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, just, okay. I mean, if you know enough about Can Canadian history, you can probably figure this stuff out. But yes, and also there wasn't safe access in and out of the community. Uh, you had to drive on the lake in winter time um, and in spring and fall when the ice is just kind of firming up or just kind of breaking up there's always the risk of going through the ice and almost every year somebody's truck would go um, luckily in the three years i was there nobody died but certainly it has happened um, mm. so you know lots of stuff and then this, those are specific problems unique to that reserve and then there's all of the usual problems that come from being a colonized people where you don't have access to decent medical care. You don't have access to a lot of the, the stuff that other Canadians do have access to. Um, but uh, so when well, I was, yeah. I, I'm yeah. interested in this. Uh, sorry to go off the book a little no, no. bit, but, but this kind of interests me because I, again, uh, um, no, this is not, there's not devil's advocate. That's not the right word because it's not, I'm not, uh, trying to posit anything, but out of genuine curiosity, I'm wondering, mm -hmm. obviously there has been this uh, long, tragic history, mm -hmm. or, or, so, you know, or deliberately of a sort of uh, targeted genocide in a way, right? Yeah. But I'm just, at this point now, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if, for instance, you were talking about maybe the expansion of the reservation. Certainly, yeah. yeah. I'm wondering, at this point in time, what do you think um, is is it now? Is it not so much a full on prejudice against this people and people are deliberately blocking those things happening, or is it this kind of unfortunate um, kind of inertia where they're so few people with so little power left that they're unable to kind of change it and and turn the and, and do you know what I mean like there's not enough representation therefore not enough people care therefore they can't raise the funds or do you still think there's a certain um prejudice demographic who still want to keep these people down um, um I think it's a little a column a and a little a column b um, and I think that, I think, you know, you'll often sort of see certain kinds of more right wing Canadians um, and right wing kind of Americans who will say like, well, you know, 
this is all ancient history and, and you know, whatever the problems now are that these people have, they're their own problems and they should kind of pull themselves up by their bootstraps and it's that, that usual kind of, you know, stuff. But, right, but, but what, I mean, what I mean is, but even if, even if you were to, let's say, for instance, if you were to fall into that camp, right, let's mm -hmm. say you thought like that, and then um, apart from the, let's forget about the history part, the, the let's improve our situation bit then, let's put it that way, is there anyone deliberately going out of their way to prevent that from happening is well, there anyone i'll get to that in a moment because oh, what okay. i want to, what i want to go what i wanted to say was was um the notion that this stuff is ancient history is it not ridiculous. for them right it's it, well, yeah. no I, I mean it's 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 living history so right. when i live in the reserve um the grandparents of many of the students that i taught were survivors of the residential school system right, right? so they themselves were taken away from their families put in schools where they were abused in various ways, uh, physically, sexually, um, emotionally, uh, language was taken away, all that stuff, you know, that happened in those uh, predominantly Catholic and in some cases, other kinds of Christian schools. Mm. Um, there were food denial experiments run on kids in the, air, in the right. region that I lived in. This is within living history, right? We're talking mm. stuff that the Nazis did right was done in uh, in canada because basically indigenous people were not seen as as having the same value right of, right. of right. you know so so you're talking about if that's within living history then the people yeah. who are my age are the children of that right. generation right so right. you are you are talking about people who are directly impacted by that trauma yes. no, no no i'm not i'm not i'm not trying to take it's yeah all, yeah I, I, I suppose i'm Talking, we can come back to that. But so, 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 so it's going to yeah. take it's going to take several generations of that that level of trauma to work itself out to where people are going to be where communities can be truly healthy. And some and right. people are there's people who are, and a lot of those people tend to be people actually who try to get more in touch with traditional ways. I've seen I've seen more problems in people who have adopted uh, Christianity. Uh, to be perfectly honest, um, there's because it lends itself to a certain amount of beating yourself up about your own failings. Like the Christian religion is very heavy on the, like, you're a bad person and you know, right. um, and so I find, I find that the traditional side of things, those people, those families who practice traditional stuff seem to be healthier. Right. Um, no, no, but so, okay. so I, here's the thing. So right, we had, we right. went through 10 years in Canada, not that long ago of having a pretty right wing government right yeah. the the um the conservative government the harper government and there was like i would say it went beyond just lack of will or lack of caring to do anything i would say that they did block and the only yeah. way that they would ever the only way they ever dealt with indigenous people was when indigenous people got upset enough to go out and attempt to do something and like blockade a road and say you can't you right. can't mine our bit of land that you've allowed us to live on you can't come in here and dig the uranium out or you know our school is literally falling to pieces you know can you help and generally speaking the answer was no so it is so in your opinion it is an it is systemic, an, an systemic, ongoing, ongoing systemic racism yes right as opposed to um um you know it's not it's it's so we're not even we're not even yet into a proper period of recovering from the trauma because it is no Ongoing. Because it's on, so that's what yeah. I kind of at, want at a lesser, at, at I, a lesser I level, know. yeah, at a lesser level than 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 abducting children. But even then, in right. the 19th, after after the um, after the residential schools were closed down in the 70s, there was what's called the scoop, which was basically the mass taking of children away from their families by social services and placing them with white families. So it it no longer became take them take indigenous kids away from their families and send them to a school where you know, and it comes up in the book uh, that there's that very famous line of like, we're going to kill the Indian in the child, right? We're going to right, basically right. reprogram them to be, you know, right and white thinking people. But what's, but, what's really interesting about that as well, I think, is to your point about people kind of trying to reclaim their heritage in a way because it, it might be healthier than trying to adopt a, a different system. Mm -hmm. But also, I, I feel as if I would imagine you know, for, for for instance, the, the the newest generation you can imagine, the brand new generation, that almost seems like why why would I do that as well? Because they they're so divorced from that 
heritage. It's, it's almost like um, it's it's almost like adopting, like back in the day, would have been adopting the white man's ways. It's almost the same to adopt our. But I don't. Ancient I don't know that they. Are, yeah. But I don't know that because they it's are. Alien to them, right? I don't know that they that it is as much though. I think that. Like for example, on on the reserve I was on, on many reserves, they have these huge powwows, right? right. Um, all all summer long, where uh, people come and dance in kind of regalia, and and it is those pieces of the culture are still very, and they were but, practiced in secret, you know, for a long time, so they were kept alive, um, okay. and then think, they, I they mean, have blossomed. I'm I'm I'm. I'm well, right. there's, 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 there's plenty of kids. There's, so there's, I mean, the kids live in two worlds, right? The kids live in the world of like playing. Call of Duty and Fortnite and having access to you know the internet and being able to go on message boards and talk to people in Japan about anime and that stuff. Right. They have all of those things now, plus they have the ability to go to powwow and you right. know and I'm not, girls and I'm not trying to stir the things that go on a powwow. I'm not going to stir. I'm not trying to stir. I'm, I'm genuinely curious about this. this. Is why I asked. But yeah, yeah. So how how much an ex and for example. For and I'm the perfect people. person to talk about this as <laughs> exactly, I, yeah. exactly. Yeah, no, who so better to ask? Come, so come with your questions to me, Nick Running Bear. Uh, mm -hmm. so, no, my yeah. kids actually gave me the name Crying Loon. <laughs> there um, you go. Perfect, <laughs> Nick yes. Crying Loon. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, but how much of that is like in a way, uh, yes, uh, like a uh, I don't, I don't want to use the word desperate. I'd rather would use the word joyous, but kind of like a grasping on to say, well, this survives. This is a relic of something that we used to do, and and it's nice. I'm glad it exists, and we like to celebrate it because it reminds us a little bit of you know who we once were. But how how many people like let's say believe in it? Because there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, religion, for example. Um, Tied in like like, like so the traditional much, like the yeah. traditional ways and traditional medicines. Yeah, the, the, I mean, like, so on. It was interesting uh, when I, when I went to work on the at the school first, and you know, and initially it was just me and my wife, and there was one other lady from outside the community who was who was actually from India, which mm. was great. So when I showed up, like the principal of the school who was from the community was like, "This is the actual only Indian who um, lives here." Mm. And I was like, awesome. I was never comfortable using that word when I lived there. The, the, they would use it all the time to wind me up, I think. Um, right. But, uh, but you know, they can do that. So, um, but yeah, so basically, why did I start to talk about this? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I was all excited. I came, I came and I was like, yes, yeah, like, I'm going to come and I'm going to make my lessons like all culturally, you know, like nuanced. And I'm going to, you know, and I was like, so I can, I'm going to like, you know uh i'll use like the medicine wheel and i'll do these things and then immediately the principal was like oh yeah no 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 you can't you can't do that and it wasn't because like you can't do that because you're an irishman and that's ridiculous which is what she should have said but what she actually said was no 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 we like half the community is quite christian and they are not going to be comfortable with you bringing any of that traditional stuff and i was like oh okay um well, what fascinating unexpected. I suppose the conflict comes in. So let's talk about that for a minute. So again, we're straying way off the book, but I don't have that much to say about the book anyway. So maybe this is is good. So, um, so in terms of that's but, you know that, everything we talk about so far directly yes directly yeah. does impact this book. So I, well, I think it. I suppose what interests me is is I wonder how much it has to do with ownership and and taking control of your destiny as well, right? So for instance, let's say largely in the European world, we've moved from um, secularism to sectarianism, right? And you mm -hmm. can say that is the, that is the, I mean, as an atheist, for example, I tend to think that's, that's the way to go, right? Uh, better to, but so on the one, I would imagine it's, it's conflicted in your mind because you know, on the one hand, if you were a, a modern, forward-thinking, you know, Native American, again, the newest generation, I would imagine you would be thinking, well, yeah, uh, you know, to be honest, I would rather embrace science and the modern ways of thinking rather than, you know, um, you know, kind of ancient mumbo-jumbo, in the same way as Christianity is mumbo-jumbo. Mm -hmm. But I suppose the fact is that, but someone else has done that for you. Yep. 
or two kind years. of gets anyway. your heckles up, right? And so it must be it must be quite distressing and and kind of frustrating to be in that situation where, on the one hand, yes, I I I would I do want to step into this modern world, but I, I want to do it on my terms, right? Rather than, but then when you have Christianity mixed in again, that mixes up even more because that's another that's another form of mumbo jumbo, right? It's competing mumbo jumbos versus modern right. science. And I, and, and so we'll we'll remind me. Don't let me not come back to this. Don't 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 let me not come back to Sweat Lodge and my experience of doing that. Um, okay. But I want I don't want to talk about it now. I'd like to talk about it maybe more near the end of of this. Let's so maybe write that down. Sweat Lodge. Sweat Lodge. Yes. Um, it's not a Judas but, Priest song is it yes I, I believe it is yes um from the uh hot rockin album um but uh, but anyway um so you know so maybe I'll, I'll say one more thing um about the, the history and then we'll get in a little bit into the book and a little bit into the movie and then we'll get back to the bigger <laughs> the bigger picture but so when when i moved to canada we'll sort I, it all out right you yeah, are, yeah, yeah, yeah. first tour, yeah 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 um, there'll be no more, no more we'll, problems in Canada. We'll all be living in harmony, side by side, on pianos. Sounds perfect. Um, so I um, moved to Canada at thirteen, and went into school right uh, midway through grade eight. And uh, right away, like right away, I started hearing a lot of racism, and from my classmates uh like uh directed towards indigenous canadians right um was there a like, nearby reservation in yes yes so the west okay. west bank west bank is just opposite Kelowna, which is okay. where i right. was and west bank is um you have one of that games now yes yeah west bank is is um is a uh, actually a very successful um reserve um the land that they have is really arable and it's great for growing grapes so there's wineries all over it and um the Canadian, basically the Trans Canada Highway runs right through it, so it's just it's valuable property. So they and they've invested really well. So they're one of the most successful reserves in in Canada. But um, but regardless, so at this time, you know, I went to school and I'm hearing all this stuff, and then very shortly afterwards, a kind of a, a civil war erupts um, on the other side of the country. Um, and there's a great documentary about it called Kanasatake. Uh, it's quite long, um, but it's a good How good documentary. That? Uh, I don't remember how to spell it, uh, but if you look up Oka, O-K-A, or or Mohawk, or anything like that documentary, uh, you'll uh, you'll come up with Kanasatake. Would it be Kana, with as in Kana spelling? Do you think C-A-N-A? K-A-N-A, I can oh, Google A. it here. Um, Kanasatake. But, okay. Yeah. Uh, so it, um, anyway, so what happened was there's this um, uh, reserve uh, that's in Quebec. And although in one of the more English speaking parts of Quebec, I think, um, and the local town called Oka decided they wanted to um, build a golf course. It was, it was almost perfect, perfect, uh, li literally on a burial ground, like a sacred mm. piece of property. And um, Have they not the seen poltergeist? Apparently not. So the local people there were uh, like no mo <laughs> Mohawk people maybe more than any other group in in canada they are um still very quick to be like no that's not good enough we're not you know like they they have not been beaten down in 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 some of the ways that other groups or you know hmm. we can well, jump back further. from documentaries like mad max 2 they're the ones that survived the apocalypse as well right so clearly yeah. Mike, I was always I always told my kids that if anybody was going to do well in a zombie apocalypse, it's going to be you guys who actually know how to use a chainsaw and, a sh you know, a shotgun. Um, so. So, yeah, so basically um, it escalates very quickly to the point where uh, the police are brought in and finally the military is brought in. Like the Canadian government is like, you know, and then at this point it becomes a flashpoint and indigenous Canadians come from all over the country. To kind of gather here to be like, no, we're gonna make a, a stand. We're gonna we're gonna finally say, no, no more of this. And you know, it 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 was a big black eye for Canada in the in the world. Like it really, everyone was like, what's going on in in Canada? Like nice Canada, where everyone says sorry. You're what's going on with your with your indigenous people there? Where you've got land of so, the crying loons. 
Yes, yeah, and I'm looking at the front cover of this. Um, so we have our, we have our, our Canadian version of Time magazine called McLean's, and this although this photograph may have even ended up on the front cover of Time as well as a picture of a Mohawk warrior who actually turned out not to even be Mohawk. I think he was Cree or something or a Jib. Oh no, he was a Jibwe. Anyway, he's got like a, a bandana around his face, and he's face to face with a Canadian soldier, right? Um, I think I've seen this picture. Yeah. And like they're like they're right. It was they're, right. Uh, some punk bands. I think DOA put it on the front of one of their albums. They're right face to face, and they've both got machine guns. And um, and for me, it was like, oh, like I know what this is. Like I know what this is. I just left this, right? This is this is what I saw on the news all the time as a kid, mm. right? In the, the north, this is um, this is that stuff again. And and then you grow up in Ireland and you go to school and your teachers are always harping on about this, how, you know, like, like we just got them out. Like we just, we finally kicked them out. Now we can force you to learn Irish. Aren't you so happy about this? And, you know, when, you know, like four generations ago, there was hedgerow teachers wandering around teaching Irish in secret in hedges, I guess. Um, and, uh, you know, we lost our culture. We lost our way of life. Um, Stuck yeah. at the fucking hedge. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, we might have talked about this before, but like I, when Ireland of the 80s, it was still had that colonized mindset, like everything was wrecked all the time. Everything was just you couldn't go. You couldn't you could never find a phone book that wasn't torn to pieces. You'd never find a public toilet that wasn't smashed and covered yeah. in excrement. However, like, you might not you might want to be careful here about confusing that with just the state of Britain in general in the 70s. And 80s. I mean, you know, maybe I, I'm, I'm anyway. not sure if if uh, I'm, I'm not sure if that was unique. OK, Ireland, in that particular regard, well, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, M maybe maybe poor people are just colonized anyway by middle class people. Maybe it's just the, the natural state of being angry all the time and and drinking too much because that's the other thing, right? Problems with alcohol. Right. Um, not unique not unique to the Irish, uh, you know, no. but oft, often an issue for people who have spent a long time under, under colonialism um, and whose self-esteem has kind of hit rock bottom. So, so anyway, so I'm watching all of this on TV and I'm trying to process it. I'm going to school and, and like the kids are talking about it at school and the teachers are talking about it. And it's all like, it's all just like bilious racism. And I'm just like, like, like you guys seem like you're the winners. I don't understand. Like, where's all of this? It is very much punching down. Where's all of this right. hatred directed at these right. people who, like, right. you've taken everything from? And I just, even at 14, it just made no sense to me. And so I think... Well, it's then clearly, we, I mean, that's clearly because it's not taught, right? I mean, that's... I mean, I think if it, people it were... It wasn't. It wasn't. Yeah, I think it is now. Were, yeah, that's what I mean. So I think if people were were brought face to face, they probably would have a lot more... Well, you'd, you'd hope at least they'd have a certain amount of sympathy, right? Well, the country's coming has had to come to a huge um, reckoning be, just because, as you know, very recently, within the last year or so, they've uncovered all of these mass graves all over the country. Right, um, right. These residential schools where, and now people who've been for many, many years, and those people on the right have always been like, ah, they're, they're just making it all up and they're all, you know, are, are having to acknowledge the historicity right. of I, I mean, what happened. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the, re the reason I asked that question way back was specifically because, to be honest, I'm not really interested in, I'm not really interested in, in what the fringe people have to say, because I don't, I don't expect to get sense from them anyway. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm kind of, I'm more interested in, yeah, I suppose, what rational people think about it, because I, I, that's kind of the, that's the majority that makes things but, happen often right and so, i think that, that it was the majority of people until very recently that just took the opinion of like i don't why can't these people get it together right okay yeah but but th that as opposed like you said the people go still going out of their way the ongoing racism that's yeah, yeah. fringe my, you would my say uh, i don't yeah i suppose but then it doesn't take many people to to make your life crappy 
I no, no, remember... no, no, no. I, again, not to not to minimize it, but I'm I'm just trying. Like I said, I'm le I'm learning here, Nick. I'm trying. Yeah, yeah. To, no, no, sure. My my context. students. So my kids, you know, on the reserve would tell me pretty regular stories about going into town, which was mm. you know the nearest town. The nearest big town was a, a predominantly white town, and people yelling stuff out the car windows at them, yelling racist slurs. Mm. You know, tell them to go back to the reserve. You know. Oh. Um, you yeah, don't yeah, wonder like, what like, those people feel threatened by, right? Like, like you said, you've taken all of this, and and I and then... think they no, I think they're just high school bullies who will look for. I mean, to some, I mean, uh, yeah, and I think also at home their parents are probably racist idiots, and then they're also that they've got that high school bully mentality of like, I know how to hurt this person. What I mean is, I'm just wondering because I I know less about kind of. So, for instance, the interesting thing in the United States, for example, in recent years is there's a certain cadre on the right who have um, kind of, they've, they've, you know, in, you know, um, uh, made motions towards trying to empower um, the, you know, the white poor and the way mm -hmm. they, that, that is by creating, you know, othering, you know, uh, black people, for example, mm -hmm. and, and to consolidate power by, by by taking one group of powerless non-elite yeah, yeah. and setting them against another. Yeah, so yeah. I'm just wondering in that particular that's been place, the history. That's yeah. been the history of but would that how power be, has made it for a long time. Do you think that those people who are yelling racial slurs, do you think oh, yeah. that's their their also yeah, yeah. people not in power trying Absolutely. to oh yeah yeah for sure. Right. Yeah. Right. They're definitely the marginalized white poor, right? Right. Um, like the, when they talk about, you know, when the immigrants went to America, you know, first it was the you know the, the Polish and mid and then the Irish came along and then the Polish got a break and then whoever else yeah came. Yeah. Just, yeah yeah you just climb up the ladder right. and whoever's at right. the bottom is the one getting kicked in the face yeah right. until the next group come right um for sure but it seems as if it seems as if uh, much like um some black Americans in the United States Native Americans maybe seem to be retaining their position <laughs> there's no one else coming along to uh no, because yeah, they are, yeah. and I, maybe there's right. some level of like national guilt or acknowledgement of the fact that like the whole country is based on um, the theft of this land, right? And, and you know, so there was a there was a group of people um, in this part of Canada in uh, in Newfoundland, basically just above us, and um, they're gone. Like uh, basically, they don't exist anymore. And 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 it wasn't even a deliberate genocide. It was more just. Um, or maybe it was, I don't know, but certainly like it certainly it came through disease. It came through not having, you know, an immune system that could cope with European germs. And then basically the Europeans coming and just hunting all a bunch of the animals to extinction as well. And basically just making it impossible for them to live. Sounds and very familiar gone. to what happened to the Ainu here in Japan. Right? Yes. Yes. And they're another indigenous people who are, have lived on the margins for a long time, for sure. Almost non-existent from what I from what I gather now, I mean, you have to, yeah, you have to travel all the way up to the top end of Hokkaido, Hokkaido to yeah. even, you know, see like a, a museum or something, but, you know, and the most, oh. most Japanese people as well, like, uh, it's not so much that they're, you know, anti or even that, it's just, it's they're not barely on the aware radar that they exist at all, yeah. But that's what, so that's what was fascinating to me about, about going to live on the reserve for the three years. It was, you got this feeling and, you know, I've driven from one side of the country to the other, and you suddenly become very aware that you can drive off that Trans Canada Highway, you know, north or south at any moment, and suddenly you'll be in Indigenous land, and suddenly you'll be in a parallel Canada. There's this, there's this whole other Canada that exists right next, but has been, for various reasons, historical and so on, just kind of kept separate, you know. And I went to a school with like, it was like maybe one kid I went to school with from an indigenous family in high school um and she wasn't even in my grade she was a year younger than me um but it's amazing I mean we were talking about being taught these things but then again that doesn't seem to be enough sometimes as well because you know some people will willingly take the wrong lessons from history right because we're talking all, about all this and there's a certain group of people who will latch on to it and say yes yes absolutely and but then they'll hijack it and they'll go down this, what's it called? The great replacement theory. Thing. Oh, yeah, now, yeah. They'll go mm -hmm. like, see, we don't want to go the way mm -hmm. of the, you know. 
So yes, yeah, yeah, so that people will learn kind of what they want to learn, right? Rather than uh... absolutely, yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I think I don't know. I just I had a hard time figuring it out back then, and I still have a hard time getting my head around it now to a certain degree. Just the, um, just the fact that it still seems to exist. There still seems to be quite a bit of well, racism, I think as well, and, I mean, and systemic, and and then of the more hostile, just well, straight up. The systemic racism stuff is actually the most difficult to get your head around, I think, because of the way it works, right, is, and in my experience, at least, going around meeting people and, you know, actually conversing with people who have views uh, different to your own, for example, um, you very, 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 very rarely meet the totally hostile, horrible, moustache twirling villain, like, almost everyone you can be friendly with that's the scary thing and ah they're all right apart from they believe this you know and and that's where that's where it gets tricky right because very right. few people wear their hit on their sleeve yes, unless yes. they're in some kind of sometimes in a but for you for, so for you and i right i mean yeah. it to some degree yes but like but Let's say there's that guy driving past in the black truck screaming, you know, Gaijin, go home. Is yeah. that a guy you can have a reason? To, because that's a guy who's. Who but that's hates... the thing. But that's the thing. Take him out of that black van and he's not surrounded by his friends and you spoke to him in an Izakaya. You, there's a good chance you might end up fighting common ground. I, I think that's why systematic, the systematic stuff is difficult to root out, right? Because there are very few actual puppet masters with mm, oh, yeah, yeah, no. things just kind of slide a certain way right it's it's almost like a landslide or something there's just it accumulates accumulates and there's you know there's and and because of 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 weather conditions and because of it's a good analogy and because of you know different things that have happened to the soil of you know the the base isn't there or the base or whatever and then mm -hmm. all of a sudden right um so right. it's very difficult. But it's also, it benefits, there's no question that systemic racism benefits one group over another, right? Um, and yeah, you know, know. If, you look, if you look at the statistics again, in, in you know, terms of like all of them, all, all, all the markers of like quality of life, of healthcare, of longevity of life, um, number of people in prison, right? right. Indigenous right. communities are way overrepresented. And in the right. States too. One fact that I think a lot of people don't know that in, is that in the U.S., um, my understanding is that more Indigenous people are actually killed by the police than than any other group in the U.S. Hmm. Um, who are like shot and killed. So it's you know, and but yet it's barely even mentioned. Like it's barely even talked about. Um, yes. So so yeah, I mean, I just I don't know. It's 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 kind of it's all bad. Uh, so we talk about this book here in a moment. We talk about this book in a moment. <laughs> oh, it's all and, bad, uh, man. Um, <laughs> well, that stuff. You heard that it stuff first. Is, yeah. That stuff is that stuff is shitty. You know, there's no there's no getting around. It. And when you have a chance to go live, and and experience um, a, living in a community that is ninety nine percent indigenous Canadian, and you have the same realization you have when you move anywhere. Like when I moved to Japan, and I was like, oh yeah, Japanese people are people. I don't, you know, it shouldn't be a surprise, um, but people are people, right? And um, it gets very hard then to take, well, why is one group of people? Are you about why to like, a rainbow out of your ass? Why is it such a struggle? Like why, and then particularly when you teach children and you're like, well, why are some kids going to have better outcomes? Why are they going to have better access to all the things that make living life easy? And why are some kids not? Um, and when that off. stuff seems... To be connected to systemic racism, uh, it's frustrating. So, Tom, sometime well, last year, we were talking about a book. Uh, yes, yeah, Sherman Alexi is this guy right. who is Remind from. Us. from uh, he's actually he's from not too far away from where I did my high schooling. So um, he's from. Uh, so the so this is an interesting. Even the border, right? The border is such a random thing for Indigenous North Americans, right? Like Canada, the U.S these these things didn't exist and um so interior salish people are the people who live in are in and around Kelowna the west bank um 
band would be um, Interior Salish, and so is Sherman Alexi, but he's from south of the border, so he's from the US, from Washington. Um, and so, yeah, he is became... Is he an US citizen then? Yes, he'd be a US okay. citizen, yeah. Um, and so, but again, interesting enough, there are some indigenous people who don't even make those distinctions. They're just like, that stuff is meaning in a way, it has meaning because they have to cross the border, but... Um, right, but it's clear it's administrative, administrative it's, rather than... Yeah, yeah, it's like they don't really see the difference. Um, so, um, so yeah, so this book, I think, was basically, I don't know, who somebody must have said to him, like, you know, you should really write a, a book for, you know, uh, so, that sorry, can be read so in high schools. Prior to, so this big book came out when? 2000 something or other, right? Yes, yeah. yeah. So prior to that, he was already a celebrated writer yeah. of regular fiction, non-YA fiction, right? Yeah, things like... Okay, like and, and the one that was turned into smoke signals. Um, it was a short uh, story. He'd written quite a few short stories. But that um, collection is The Lone Ranger and Tonto, Fist Fight in Heaven, right? Yes, yeah. Right. Um, and so, as I said, like, so I watched Smoke Signals when it came out, uh, like in the cinema. I went, a friend of mine who is um, interior Salish, um, her name's Tanya. We went to art school together and she wanted to see it because it was at the time quite celebrated uh, because it was the first movie that was written, mm. directed and produced by um, indigenous North right. Americans, right. a lot of them being Canadian. Um, uh, and it kind of, it gave a start to um, Adam Beach, who has had a fairly long uh, career in cinema ever since yeah. he's still yeah. in so lots of big, stuff. Big break was with being with Nicolas Cage in that not very good John Woo film, Wind Talkers, right? About yeah, the, yes. the yeah. Navajo Marines. Yeah, um, yeah. this is one of my favorite. And he's actually just from up the road from the reserve that I taught on. So he's from... Okay. From that part of of uh, Canada, a lot of a lot of um, it's you know that that thing is that thing Canadians do of like pointing out all the Canadians in TV shows and movies. Like, oh, you know William Shatner. Right. Oh, right. yeah. Right. Um, so it also happens with our Indigenous actors, but I, I think it's, it's easier because because comparatively speaking, maybe Canada it's 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 not been good, but like we do seem to have done a better job of producing. Um, people with the self-esteem enough to be actors. Mm. Uh, the U.S. has far fewer indigenous actors. Um, so a lot of times the people you see in American movies, like your like Graham Greene, for example, who was in, you know, Dancing mm. with Wolves and stuff, um, they're often Canadians. Um, so anyway, Adam is, and so is the other guy. So um, when I said, let's go back to this book. Yeah, let's talk about the movie. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, if there's time at the end, we might mention this fucking book. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, they're kind of the same thing in a way. Yeah, well, I, 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 I not... finished the film, so I'm not okay. going to have much to say. Um, okay. Yeah. I mean, um, th this is much my, not problem, but this is much my reaction that I had to the book in a way is so. Well, see, I'd rather talk about the book first because. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah we can do that. That makes more sense from, from my okay, sure, own mind. Yeah. Okay. Although I feel like the book is a reworking of the movie. Um, yeah, no, no, I don't mean for like, yeah. just inter, to, sure. in 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 because I I have I only watched half the movie and I don't want to say sure. what I want to say about yeah, the yeah. Movie. Sure. yeah, okay. So the book is about it's a kind of a thinly veiled autobiography, I guess, um, and yeah. that became I wasn't sure how much of it was was true and how much of it wasn't until right. I read the afterward in this new version. It does seem like like a reasonable amount of the stuff that he talks about yeah. did happen. Um, was Kevin and Alexi born with water on the brain? Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. All that stuff is true. Yeah, and right. having the seizures and the big, the giant glasses that he wore as a kid and all of that stuff. Right. Um, and therefore, I guess he did maybe look a little bit like the uh, the actor who plays another analog version of him in the um in the right. movie. Uh, Evan Adams, right? Yeah. Hmm. So in the in the book, basically, he um he decides to leave the reserve, which mm. is kind of, or the reservation, it's the US, um, which is kind of almost an unheard of thing. People don't do that. He decides to to go to a, an all white school that's off reserve. Um, yeah, yeah. When he can get there because it's miles away. Yeah. So he needs a, 
he needs to hitchhike there or get a lift or something, right? Uh, yes. There's yeah. no there's no bus running there, obviously, because mm-hmm. well, there's only one kid going there, so I guess. It's not <laughs> yes. Him. Yeah. Um, and then he can't always depend on his family or his dad to be right. able to pick him up right. uh, for various different reasons. Um, and so, I mean, that's really what the book is. I guess yeah, I, mean, I don't know what yeah, to I, say. I, that's kind it's of all, all about how he. Yeah, it's the conflict between. You know, he's he's feeling like a bit of a turncoat who's betrayed yeah, his own traitor, yeah. people, but also he needs to kind of do more with his life. And I suppose it comes to a head where he ends up uh, playing basketball and 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 um, you know trouncing the team from the res. Yeah. And and he's like, yeah. And then he realizes, oh, hang on, I'm I'm not I'm I'm not David. I'm Goliath, right? Yeah. Basically. Yes. Um, yeah. Which is, you know, it's, it's it's quite well done and all that. And he's, you know, he's coming and learning about girls and stuff like that. And and yeah, it's it's boiling down all these kind of things that I'm sure is is in all these other fiction, but making it palpable for a YA audience. Mm-hmm. Yes, and, yeah. and I think a, a big part of the heart of the book is this is this friendship he has, which is kind of the same relationship or the same friendship that we see in the Smoke Signals movie, right? right. With right. with a quite a tough res yeah. kid who. Yeah. It's better. That, it's it's much more well done in the book. I, although I don't know because it's comparing apples and oranges. Because of course the film is based on a short story mm-hmm. as well, which I haven't. Have you read that collection? The I, Lone Ranger. Yeah, but it's Hunter? it's I, ages ago, and I remember it being like the the movie is a massively expanded version of quite a very short oh, oh, okay. story. So well, yeah. So prior to re- so had you re- read Sherman Alexi non YA before you read YA Sherman Alexi? Good question. Or have you read it since, actually? Because I'm wondering, d- depending on your depending on your take on this book, I would you be like, well, if you didn't necessarily go for this, I would recommend Sherman Alexi's non YA stuff, or is it of a piece? No, I mean the adult stuff is not is not quite the same. It's not quite as um, in some ways, you know, it is it's it's simpler. It's written so that it can be read by somebody who's in you know grade seven or whatever, right? Comfortably. Yeah. Um, there's more, there's more poetry, I think, and because he's he's okay. a poet as well. So I, it, right. I feel it feels like it's a more more of a poetic. So do, in general, do you like Sherman Alexis' books? Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah. Okay. And would you recommend Sherman Alexis' books to me? Yes, sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But okay. let me go back. Let me take. Let, let me take a look through what I've got here, and then I'll. I haven't like I haven't prepared a a list of like where to go next, but maybe okay, we can do. Okay. Because I feel as if this is not. An entry point to appreciate Sherman and Alexi for me, at least. as an as an adult, maybe not. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. So, so my feelings are it's it's not a bad book at all, and of course it is a very swift read. I mean, mm-hmm. I more or less set, read it in a sitting. It's like a you know, it's very swift read, and it is you know, um, it's a it's a, you know, it's a well written book and all that, and it does have obviously interesting things in it. But I feel as if a book like this. If it weren't, if it hadn't been a, a fast read, then mm-hmm. I think it would have become more of a chore for me. And I and I say that just because it's the kind of book I can appreciate uh, objectively mm-hmm. rather than subjective. And I think, and you know, feel free to disagree with me, but this kind of book, uh, to my mind, has two audiences. That it's necessary for, right? Mm-hmm. So the one audience is it's 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 representative, right? Which is very important. I understand that. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. I haven't grown up on a reservation. I'm not Native American. Mm-hmm. I'm very well represented as a white male European. So mm-hmm. I don't feel the need for representation. But I get that if you're reading about someone like you, mm-hmm. then that's important. And it's and and you know. So I'm not I'm not down on. I'm just saying that it's not for me yeah uh, reason one that and then okay. reason two the other audience i think this is very important for is people on the other side of the you know on the other side who maybe have some kind of prejudiced views towards native americans or have grown up in environments which have you know fermented those views mm-hmm. and it's their chance to see someone as human so it's it's either right. representative of who you are or it's it's a, you know it's it's a chance to humanize someone who you may have 
demonized. And I'm neither. I, I, I don't have prejudice against Native Americans and neither mm -hmm. do I need the representation of. So therefore the, the book for me, the only way it would work would be as an entertainment. Mm -hmm. And it does that, it's, it's fine. Mm -hmm. But like I said, only because it only took me an hour and a half to read or something. If it had been much longer, I right. would have been cursing. Well, I, don't think it, I don't think it needs to be. I think, I think that's something oh. that Sherman Alexi is good at i mean I, it's uh you know even uh the movie smoke signals is like an hour and 25 minutes it's just right. it's no longer than it needs to be but to before, get we, before we move on and, and yeah. do you does that does my reaction to it does that make sense to you or do you think i'm missing to some, degree, to some degree i i i think that there's there's more going on in the in the book for me than than just what you've kind of talked about i think um one I mean, of the things good, that it's a good YA novel, I would say. I'm just saying that it's not for me. Yeah, because I, I think the thing that, that it represents really well, actually, and maybe this is something bigger, that, and maybe this is why it had quite good legs in the US and Canada, I think, for teenagers, is that there's it was actually a hit, not, right? It was a problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's there's yeah. not a lot of books written recently that I'm aware of about poor kids, hmm. regardless of skin color, regardless of... of family back but just about kids who don't come from middle class homes who who have more disrupted lives for various reasons and a lot of that stuff struck me as effective and powerful like there's a part quite near the beginning of the book where basically they can't afford the vet bills right and oh it, yes. yes it grabbed me it grabbed yeah, me that's pretty, it grabbed uh, me hard and i yeah. and i you know the first time i read the book i cried and i was surprised because it's a kid's book and i was like oh shit um but i yeah i got it and I'm not even a, an animal lover, but I got what it would be like to feel like my family can't afford for me. You've, you've heard it here first, uh, uh, viewers. Nick hates animals. I do. I, I'm an animal hater. Yes. Um, he only likes insects. So, yes, just bugs. Um, so, so yeah. So th there's there's moments like that in the book that are I think are are really effective, and um, and some of the stuff around also just like the vagaries of a friend of a teenage friendship like the ups and downs and like that stuff I thought was well observed. And I, you know, I had some weird and rocky friendships. Um, mm. And so there was enough, there was enough else in the book that I think was universal, I guess, um, or uni like more bigger than, yes. but then, but then That's the other true. thing, That's what true. I really liked, and what I would also say I really liked is that, um, and Sherman Alexi can do this because of who he is. Mm. Um, it is not, and it tries really hard not to be um, the uh, romantic or like, like it. He's it not the, nice. He's not nice the, to his own community. No, it doesn't go the magic Negro uh, route. No, not at all. No, no. It, it's a, it's 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 the the needles go into both sides. Like yeah, I mean, he really. Yeah. He's angry, and he's angry not just at why. In fact, if anything, he seems more angry at his own community, and that comes through a little bit in Smoke Signals as well. There's a lot of anger um, about a childhood that has family you can't rely on because of drugs right. and alcohol right. and the rest of it, right? Um, I just wanted to, now that you've said that, the universe, I, I wanted to a little bit, uh, just a little bit further into what I was saying earlier. He was, yes, there is the universe, and don't get me wrong, it's not when I was saying there are certain audiences for this, there is universality that everyone can relate to, but, what, but the universality of it, for me, is not exceptional, if you will. Okay. It. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah. so that's what but I mean. Is this, literally this says book, in the book, though, because this, then he says something about, like, every, every poor childhood is the same. Like, there's, like, yeah. so this this, book, there's a part. I suppose this, what I mean is this book works at an exceptional level potentially for those two audiences whereas mm -hmm. for if 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 you're not necessarily in need of any of those then right i think it it's it's just fine like it's just fine like I, it doesn't mm -hmm. make me want to read more sherman like uh, certainly not more sherman alexi ya let's put it right i don't way. think there is any more anyway so you don't have to worry about that oh, okay um right. but yeah yeah so i mean i i said i do get that but i as i i think Obviously, I have an attachment to the book because I first read it when I lived on the reserve and I read it aloud. I did it as a read aloud. And that was a, it was a, a weird and awkward thing to do in some ways. Um, 
not least of which because there's one like really off color joke uh, in the book where you're like, whoa, um, where the N word is used and um, and a buffalo is involved. Nigel. Yes, the word. Oh, yes, yes. They don't have yes. a what Nigel, do they? Yes, they do. Um, so so yeah. Um, but no, mostly because of uh, this, the, in the opening chapters when he talks about like the white people who go work on reserves. Mm. And I find that quite funny, right? Uh, the kind of the, the combination like Christian folks and the health, the do-gooders, the liberal do-gooders, which I guess teacher, I would have fallen into that category. In his pajamas. Did you ever teach in your pajamas, Nick? I know I was never quite that bad. Um, yeah. but, uh, but I remember the first day, literally the kids asked me like, um, like, whoa, like, what did you do? Like, what, like, you must have fucked up real bad. Like, right. did you, like, like, what did you do at the, at the real school to get sent here? Yeah. And I had to basically say, like, no, no, I, I choose to be here. Yeah. This is not some kind of situation where I... Ironically, I Shiv and Alexi may be in that position. <laughs> <laughs> well, Both maybe. accusations. Um, but, so... So yeah, but so I, th that whole opening part where basically, you know, like the, the school is kind of falling apart and the textbooks are all like 50 years old, you know, right. there was some, some right. of those things were realities um, yes. Yes. to a degree. Oh, no, I'm not, I'm, I'm not of, of my experience, right? At all. No, no. So but what I mean, that's so when you're reading the book out loud to kids and, and then the message of the book basically is leave, like, don't stay mm. here. Don't feel any, don't feel any, um, whatever would you would call it whatever would keep you there you know like you need to that, the whole, yeah the whole part about yeah the whole part about hope being multiplicative and there is no hope here was like it, you know it was a uh, it was interesting to read that two kids who were in that situation did your, did your stu i mean did your students um would you say that their reaction to it was um like overwhelmingly like like did it seem like holy shit here's someone finally yes talking about this situation yes. in a way that i think so right. and they appreciated okay. the humor i think they really appreciated like the, there's stuff that is very much res based humor or you know right right fart jokes and stuff that will always well maybe go over with boys and in of any age but you know um there's no need to be uh, excess about fart jokes Everyone that's true yeah, yeah yeah um so so yeah, I think I think they they did recognize or they saw, and then the fact that, like I said, it, it doesn't it doesn't um, sugarcoat things, right? Um, and I think the kids appreciated that that the book wasn't. Yeah, there's a part in the book which seems so real to me as well, where they go to like a power or something, and there's like he gets like kneed in the groin by these like triplets, and then he casually mentions that these guys are like thirty something, you know, right, right, you know, and he's like a fourteen year old kid or whatever, you know, and and that. Th those kind of people are also there, right? You know, like the reserves can be tough places with some mm. scary people. Mm. Um, and I th you know, the other thing that, that bummed me out about the book, I guess, and even rereading it this time, I was like, yeah, this, this part sucks. When he talks about, you know, the difference between him and his friends at the white school was that like, they had maybe been to one or two funerals and he had right. been to dozens and dozens and dozens. Right. And that's absolutely true. Um, and I think that's that's a reality that's just that sucks. Yeah, actually, to be fair, I, I should say there's a few little moments like that where I did feel that I was learning something. I mean, the overall experience was, you know, not not it wasn't like ah, I know all this that <laughs> necessarily, but I, I I wasn't necessarily felt as if I was learning some stuff that I'd not read before or or told in a way for me again not for all of this but for me mm -hmm. was in a way that made me you know appreciate it a new way but but yeah there were a few moments like that actually that 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 was a point that was worth raising that did me raise my eyebrows and think oh i've not necessarily seen things put in those terms before whether in YA fiction or non YA fiction or you know maybe it's out there it's just i haven't come across it before let's put it that way but i would say it was it's very true of the kids that i talk oh, yeah, i don't i don't uh, deny it. that's why i think that's why i because yeah I thought, wow that's kind of uh, mm, that's putting things in a a perspective that certainly makes you think right mm -hmm. which i i think that's what i wanted 
and again, maybe unfairly because that's not what it's designed to do, but that's what I would have wanted out of a book like this. Right. To make me want to read it more, if you see what mm -hmm. I mean. Sure. Like I, so, I wasn't necessarily in need of a coming of age yeah. get the ball. Sure, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Story. In fact, for me, that's what's that's the funniest thing, because that's that's the part that's least interesting to me too. Um, because I'm not a sports guy. And then I'm kind of like, how do you like how do you get to be a, a guy who's really good at, at that and also good at drawing cartoons and like you know, like it's, it's like pick a lane. Like you can't you can't be good at basketball and good at writing. Interesting, um, interesting to me as well that um uh the illustrations in the book aren't his though right no 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 and i don't know that he actually can i think that was more just maybe there's been a few kind of like die of a wimpy kid and things like that that had come out around the same time that had been successful that had had these kind of cartoon drawings in them and i that more seemed like it maybe it was a decision made by the Do you think that might that might not be part i of doubt I, maybe, maybe maybe he liked to draw okay. when he was a kid but i don't know what did you make of the uh drawings they're fine. I mean, they're, right. they're, not, right. they're, they're, yeah, neither here nor there. Yeah, they, wasn't... they neither add or subtract, I think. Uh, yeah. Um, weirdly, guys, I, I read it as a paper copy, all the, but then they're in color in the Kindle version, which was weird. Oh, they weren't in color in mine. Yeah, yeah. As I said, I think they're, they were in, always in black and white, but maybe when they put it out, somebody just digitally colored them or something. So. Well, it was a Kindle I read that I didn't have a hard copy. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, but um, but just to touch on the movie just for a second, the thing I like most about the movie is actually Evan Adams, um, and I'm fascinated by him because I don't know that he did anything else, like in movies. I think right. he was one of those people who like uh, so he's the the one who plays the Sherman Alexi right kind of analog character because he's like what is his job now? He's the chief medical officer for First Nations Health Authority in British Columbia now, so he. That's racist is. calling him chief. <laughs> yeah, I, yes, it would be if it wasn't actually the name of his job. Um, so yeah, he apparently I expect more from Munich. I'm disappointed, I tell you. <laughs> he went, he clearly um yeah, he became a doctor. Like an and uh I don't know. I'm always I'm always interested in people who like start out in acting and do like I think he was great. I think he's one of the most interesting things in the movie. It's such a strange performance. Um, I didn't get then, on in the film at all, to be honest with you. Okay, all right. Yeah. I, I quite like the movie. I it's it's not terrible, um, but it's just, it's, um, and I understand its importance. I also like Gary Farmer a lot, the guy who plays the dad. Yeah, he's good in it, but it, it, it was just, regardless of, 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 of its importance, and again, the representation, it was just so out of um, 90s indie pindly hell. Oh, me. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, There's no question about that, sure. Um, I'm not. I'm still not quite ready to go nostalgic for that stuff yet. I might be okay. on the cusp of it, but and yeah, mm -hmm. it wasn't terrible, but it was just um, what I saw of it, it. It was just so like meandering, and 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 that yeah, that slightly irksome attempt at quaint or I, I don't know what it is. Okay. I, I don't know if there's a word for it yet. It's okay. if you grew up in the nineties. <laughs> yes, you, you know what you know that is. It. You know, you know what I'm. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it was nice. I liked seeing uh, what's her name, Elaine Miles from uh, mm -hmm. Northern Exposure. Oh, Elaine Miles. I haven't seen her in it mm. driving her car backwards. Um, Cynthia Geary from Northern Exposure was in it as well, wasn't she? Mm -hmm. um, yep. Yeah, Gary Farmer's good. Tantu Cardinals. Um, yeah, it's. It was just. Yeah, it, I. I just felt. I was wasting my time. Watch. I wasn't going to get much, okay, out of it, and I, I you know, I, and it wasn't a bar of laughs. And I had a question for you, actually. I don't know if you'd be mm -hmm. interested in this so, about the accents. Yes. So, yeah. So this is set in Idaho, nineteen seventy-six, right? And right. All the characters speak, all the North American characters at least speak with a very specific accent. And mm -hmm. I was trying to figure out: is this accent? Is this? Is this Idaho? Or is it is it a specific like Native American Idaho? Because they have very weird accents that <laughs> went from like Irish to um, Indian as an in Asian Indian, and then 
wondered something. So they were a very peculiar accent. Are they Idaho or are they Native American? Idaho. What are these accents? Because everyone was doing it uniformly. I don't know if they were doing it well or not. I, I, I couldn't tell. But clearly they were all aiming for a certain accent. Yes. I couldn't yeah, tell what that quite, accent was. I'm not quite sure either. There, I mean, there is a generally slightly sing-song equality to... And, you know, I, I can often tell, not always, but, I, you know, um, unless somebody's grown up in the city and completely off reserve, but I can often tell um, if somebody is indigenous because there is a certain, like, there's a, there's a certain consistency, at least in, across Canada. Um, right, okay. But, so you see that, more, but, it's but more are, of that than an Idaho thing, because I was trying to, I was trying to think about... It, it seemed like an exaggerated, like, it seemed like they'd chosen an accent and then exaggerate because it seemed more full on than yeah, anything I've ever seen in it real sounded, life. It, 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 it seemed to me as if it was like the the Bob and Doug McKenzie of reservation talk or something like that. Like they maybe, they'd um, maybe it up a, a little bit, like I like someone that saying that maybe, "a" all the time, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think you might you might be right. It was a, a which is a, a strange choice. choice if you think about it. Like, is that supposed to be funny? Is that is that funny? Is that make it funnier? Possibly to a to an indigenous audience to a who kind of don't hear them don't hear their right. own accents much in movies and so to have it played up in that way. The one thing I did like as well is the 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 local um the, the what's his name something fall apart or something is oh yes Lester falls does, apart yes, yes the guy who does the weather report and the traffic mm -hmm. report because mm -hmm. they were straight out of like an episode of Father Ted right like that's <laughs> but, that's provincial. But that's Everywhere. very much right. That's very much yes. That is very much reserve life. And yeah, it is totally small town Ireland. Or, right. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, and actually, so you know, you that was so that was John Trudell in the radio station. Okay. Um, and John Trudell is probably better. I mean, he 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 is in a few movies. He's in what's that movie? Thunderheart with um, Graham Greene and. Uh, I don't think I ever saw Thunderheart. Yeah, it's it's um you're better off watching it's it's weird. Michael Apted, I think that's who it is, right? He made two movies back to back. Oh, one of them, it's at Oglala. Yeah, yeah, which right. is a really interesting and good documentary. That's and then he made, yeah. Yeah, and then he made a weird fictionalized version of exactly the same story um with uh Val Kilmer in it. Um right. playing an FBI agent and then Graham Greene. Oh, okay. I was gonna say that famous indigenous actor Val Kilmer. Um yes, yeah. Right. Um, um and so, oh, is I have that, a funny thing. Is, is that rubbish then, the Thunderheart side of things? Is that yeah, 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 it's, oh, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty, pretty crappy. But John Trudell's in it. But he, he, he kind of had a second life as a movie actor around that time. Um, but he was originally in uh, AIM, the American Indian Movement. Oh, okay, so right. He was, he was, um, and he was, uh, he when they took over. Wounded knee and, and all that yes, stuff. Yes, yeah, right. yeah. And he was also at Alcatraz. So he was involved in the takeover of Alcatraz when ah. uh, group of AIM uh, folks took it over and then he ran like Radio Free America where he had a, a radio station from there that was kind of pirate broadcasting um, right. during right. their occupation so yeah he's a he's also a musician and I've read stuff that he's written and he's a I think he's passed away now but I, he was he was a cool guy I I have a lot of appreciation for John Trudeau so I've got a and note here I've but, got a note oh, yes. here Sweat yep. Lodge you made me write okay. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we talked about um, religion and, yes. and magic and medicine and all that good stuff. And so going back to, um, you know, for a second, like when, when you and I and Darren talked about magic, mm. right? We, we read a big book. I think it just came up in the last episode we, we talked about as well. Um, who knew that was going to be a bit of a Rosetta Stone? It's going to come back again and again. I didn't like that book at all. But when we were talking about magic, it was interesting. Because you're, boy, it was called, wasn't it? Yeah, just you're a big, that. you're a big non-believer, um, and uh, Darren is a practitioner, and then I'm sort of agnostic. I'm a romantic. I like the idea of it, but I can't bring myself to actually believe in any of it. Right? Mm. Um, but Pick aside, Nick. Yeah, the older I get, though, the more interested I get in in all of the Celtic. Oh, I mean. Don't Malarkey. make me wrong. Don't make me wrong here. I'm as fascinated by it as you are. Mm -hmm. I just 
at the end of the day, it's nonsense. Yeah, yeah, it's not science. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But I, but I'm starting to lean into like the whole idea of like maybe I do need to go to the beach and build a bonfire and dance around naked by myself. Oh, it's thinking. all good stuff. I mean, it can all lead to interesting stuff as long as you don't actually believe that it's. Yeah, I'm not. Ta- I'm not going to be able to talk to Lou of the Long Arm or any of the other great Celtic gods. I... You, you might, but right. it'll all be in your head. That's all. Yes, as long yes. as you realize, I'm sure you can astrally project um, <laughs> okay. but it's all in your head you're not actually right you know. okay so um but what's interesting is where where's the line between where's the line between science and magic or where is the line because you know where is the line between medicine and magic and religion and science right so sweat lodge is one of these things where it's slightly hazy for me but it's it, smoke isn't it yeah yeah that's a big part of it i think um so i remember who was it maybe billy Connolly on one of his like one of his trips around you know he, he did a michael palin type of thing where he went around various places and later on when he was asked about the various experiences the one that he came back to maybe it was him maybe it was somebody else i don't know anyway um i now i'm thinking about the other guy morgan spurlock who did the um the hamburger eating documentary uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um he did a hamburger thing. eating documentary. <laughs> yeah, that's the one. Uh, Super size me. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah, it was it was like a, an Andy Warhol thing. It was just a man eating a hamburger really slowly for an hour and a half. Um, but anyway, um, I had read about Sweat Lodge and I'd seen a few documentaries and things where people went and did it and came back and said it was kind of a, a life-changing thing, right? And then I was living on the reserve for a couple of years and we were in... Um, we were in Winnipeg uh, for a conference of indigenous educators and stuff. And I was along because my school was an indigenous school. And so on the third day, my principal was like, so, you know, there is actually a sweat lodge going on outside, outside the city in the countryside. And, you know, they've set it all up and like, would you want to go? And, you know, it's not a thing where you get invites to that kind of thing very often mm. uh, as an, an indigenous person. Mm. And I was like, yeah, I would totally like to go. That sounds awesome. And so we drove out into the countryside and um, the guy who was running it was actually, uh, this is a great, this is a perfect example of where this line is. He was an astronomer, a Cree uh, astronomer who had a science background, but also knew all of these amazing stories. Like they have, they have other constellations, right? As you would if you didn't grow up in a Greek and Roman right, right. based, you know, so he had all of these other stories for what the start, like which constellations were what and what the stars. Anyway, cool guy. Uh, so we, we all went in, a bunch of us sat around in um, the space. And it's pitch black dark in there. They bring in the stones from outside and put the water on. And it kind of begins, it's kind of like it's one part church, one part sauna, I guess, you know, so at the beginning, but also one part just social gathering. So at the beginning, right. there What's are some the, songs. Just before you continue into the details, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of interested. What would be the distinction between a regular sweat lodge and a vision quest? I don't know. I have never oh, been okay. on a vision okay. quest, so I, I have no idea. Um, right. But so we, you know, we all went in and I was behind this huge cop, this huge indigenous police officer, like like shoulders like this. And I'm just like pasty, like English. fleshy around the middle little white Irish guy, you know, and I'm like, oh, this is awesome. We're all in our skivvies, basically, and going into this thing. And it's it's co-ed, so there's women there as well as men. And it begins with basically just some greetings and people saying, like, hi, I am whoever. And then there was some sort of prayers and songs and things. And then just very much a, like, how's everyone doing? Because right. people had, you know, people would have come from different uh, reserves uh, and stuff and hadn't seen each other in a while. And this isn't, a, this isn't me being facetious. This is a genuine yeah. question. <laughs> a peace pipe? would have been passed. yes oh right yes. okay okay yeah, she was yeah which i remember thinking at the time like holy shit because i don't i'm not a tobacco smoker mm. i am not a smoker of anything really but yeah but you know you don't when in rome um so uh so yeah that, that heroin addiction of yours is it'll, it'll do you don't need <laughs> yes to. yeah and so we um and so it, like, it, it goes on and on like and so you know once it starts to cool down a little bit <laughs> I have this image of your work <laughs> like like but it's it's kind of great though because like and then like like as, as soon as the temperature starts to come down like these rocks come back in and then yeah. they'll throw various kinds of like they were throwing sage and and other things on 
who knows what they were throwing out of the rocks, but it would kind of burn up and, and permeate the air. And, um, and at one point like, early on, like the guy running it said, like, if anybody needs to step out for a moment, if it does get to be too much, if that, the, the heat and the steam is too much. Um, we're all going to laugh at you. Basically, so, you know, I was like, I'm not going to be the first person to leave. <laughs> I'm not going to be the white guy. not going to be the first guy out of this place. So, but it was, it was tough. Crying <laughs> loon defies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, eventually we, um, there was a break where a number of people went out. So I had to go out and he told me, he said like, pour water on the back of your neck. Mm. And uh, it was huge. I mean, I was starting to kind of almost go gray, like at the sides of my vision. I was like, oh, I might pass out. Um, and went back in. But like, in this like when i went back in and like and and just like it you know it just um it was so womb like it was so dark and so hot and i got these visions of my mother mm. and i got this feeling of utter peace and happiness and connectedness with, with the world it was one of these like what is going on what's my brain doing where are these chemicals coming from that are flooding my brain and body and i so we left we drove back into the city and i walked into the hotel where all of the other people were and all of the other um, teachers and and people from the community were immediately like, "Ah, oh, Nick, you were at Sweat Lodge, right?" And I was like, and "I guess part of you probably smell like you've been at Sweat yeah. Lodge, like um, because well, yeah, the... that is science and brain chemistry." Well, yeah, but my pupil, I saw my pupils had dilated after like here, like I was, it looked like I had gotten really stoned, and I felt like I'd gotten really stoned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and the high I've... lasted three days. I... I've been I've been stoned in a proper old style um, uh, sauna with rocks. Yeah, that's, that's what this was. Yeah, that's what this yeah, was. Yeah. So yeah, I've I've had the two conflated into I, one, and it's kind of an yeah, like I experience. sweat. I sweat all the evil out. I sweat all of my like my my regrets, and it was just like it all just poured out mm. of my pores. Mm. And I left, and I was like, and I thought like, crap, I'd love to do this like once a year. Yeah, because of course you didn't, happen. and they came back in three days, right? So, yeah, that's <laughs> well, no, it, it 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 went on for a while, but yeah, I think I no, think no, it but be... it's interesting. It's it, it's something. It's it's funny. I I used to smoke a lot of weed at a certain period in my life. I was stoned every day for about three years or something and then i it, it kind of rewires your brain or something i don't know if that makes any sense to and then mm -hmm. i didn't smoke for the longest time and now i found um on the occasion that um <clears throat> a friend of mine indulges mm -hmm. that friend um feels the benefits of it for like yeah, of you, course. you smoke and then it reminds yeah. you, it resets everything and you just, mm -hmm. oh, this is what it's all about kind of thing. And you just, and the feeling stays with you for a while. It eventually peters out and you have to do something mm -hmm. else to remind yourself, to reset yourself. But um, yeah, it, I, I think there's something to be said for the, it's, even if you experience that kind of thing only once, it, it, it kind of, it's a roadmap to show you the way for the future. And right? so when you mm -hmm. get into that state again, you you kind of know um what to look for or mm -hmm. whereas opposed if you've never had an experience like that do you know what i mean like yes yeah, you've yeah. never had an experience like that be it you know whatever form so i guess my takeaway from the experience was in part like if this is what like i mean maybe it is maybe church is like that for some people maybe yeah, some let's go is. and actually do have that kind of but I never did. I never had any no. anything remotely like that uh, that I got from going to to church no, or going to confession. Did, and I'm not, not, again, not being facetious. I think you needed to come to it your own terms, and you needed to trigger that um, you know white liberal guilt bit of yourself to allow it to enter via another. Maybe, no. although just the pure physicality of the actual experience of being that hot yeah. for that long, like like there, there there is another like that in that way it seemed like it was some weird mixture of magic and and medicine to me, and, and I got so when the the people again in the community who did practice those kind of things, I could see why maybe they seem more centered because I think the things that they were doing made them feel better in a way that I don't think beating yourself up because you're not a good enough Christian. But again, I don't know, maybe if you are, that's self-fulfilling. Well, I don't know, that's just like, the, I mean, I mean, if you're going by, if you're judging by 
the health of the overall community, then obviously they're not doing too well, right? <laughs> no, but, but I'm saying that the, that the people who the people who seem to be doing better were often the people practicing again. As a, uh, right, as opposed to yes, following yes. something else. Right, right. Yes, yeah, yeah. But again, it's also you could argue that it's 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 another form of um, also whatever the bottle brings you, right? It is temporary reprieve from right. your shitty surroundings. But probably healthier. Probably healthier, I would have thought. Um, yes. But again, chemical. Yeah, yeah, maybe. But yeah. but maybe yeah. Not not maybe. Um, okay. Definitely. <laughs> Sorry, I, I can't help myself. <laughs> it, it, I'm, not, I'm not meaning shit because I think that's the thing is some it's it's not my practicality doesn't doesn't cut out um, magic if you want to call it that or, <laughs> or an amazing experiences or things that where well, you can't explain. But it, you know, I feel just as much joy in those. I, I have experiences as well. You know, I don't believe in all any of that shit, but I still occasionally will feel freaked out, like in a place that I've heard is haunted, or mm -hmm. I'll think, "Fuck, that, that's a mirror." Yeah, you know, I still. Because that's what I I feel that those things are so embedded in our human brains and we'll never get rid of them, which is why I think embracing the practice, you don't you need not worry that you will lose your superstitious primitive mm, right, right, reactions yeah, it's always be because you're going to anyway, you know, fucking send Richard Dawkins to the most haunted house in the world in the middle of the night by himself and mm -hmm. you'll be going, ah! you know. <laughs> You're not going to get over it, so it's fine. You embrace in practice as much. I think we're still outweighed by our magical mm -hmm. thinking, so it's don't worry about it. You're not going to lose your poetry, right? Right, I think sure. Um, but yeah, I think that's kind of that. I don't know, it's a, maybe a strange place to end, but I don't know that I have much <laughs> else to say about um, no, about no, no, a bit of a rumbling, but again, that's what sometimes we talk about the book, and sometimes the book are triggers for yes, us to rumble we'll about things that are bigger than that, yeah, yeah, and I. Agreed. Um, I don't know how much so, this, uh, interesting listening it is for anyone else, but you know, it's fucking free. You can turn it off anytime. Exactly. So fuck off. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Stop moaning. Mm -hmm. 